Okay, get ready. Up. Well, thank you. I'm very excited to be here. I'm Danny Egan, director of the Olympia Museum Association. This is our sixth and final Museum Hive event, which is, it seems like yesterday, Brad, that we got this thing going, and here we are at the tail end of it. And I think we've learned a lot, been through a lot, and a lot of different people buzzing around the hive and doing their thing, which has been a lot of fun. We've had a lot of great visitors from afar, and the final one we're really excited about is the wonderful Emily Grassley. Hello, Emily. How are you? Hi. Thank you for having me. Yeah. So just very quickly, I'm welcoming you on behalf of NEMA, but this is like a much bigger thing than that. This has taken off in many ways because you have a lot of people that have been participating around the country. And I know at uh, AAM a few months ago, I was on a panel specifically about Museum High and kind of a new thing in networking and professional development, content delivery, and all this kind of stuff. So it's been a great experiment. I know that we've got a lot to talk about in terms of things we can learn. And as Brad pointed out, we need volunteers to think about how do we sustain this over the course of time? How do we keep this going? Do we want it to continue and so forth? But we're really definitely here in New England, the trend side is we're trying to figure this out for the rest of the field. So you're but it's very valuable. And with that, I'm going to introduce Brad Larson, the genius behind this, and uh, also welcome Ed Rodley, one of the geniuses behind this. Thank you so much, guys, for your participation. Sierra Peters, and we got to welcome as well, one of the great leaders and thought promoters, provocateurs of this thing. So anyway, take it away, guys. Thanks right. a lot. Well, I'm just going to make one more pitch for Museum Hive, and uh, let's keep this conversation, let's keep this conversation going. So uh, if, if you can stay here, uh, a little bit after, we'll have a 15 minute debrief after this for people who are interested if you have to go over this by that. And now I'd like to hand it over to Ed Rodley. Are you ready, Ed? <laughs> yes, I am. Okay. Uh, gosh, what else needs to be said? Uh, for those of you who haven't been here before, uh, the format is very simple. We have an invited guest speaker, who in this case is Emily Grassley, who's going to be talking to us for a little bit about her own interesting career path. Uh, but then the main point of the Museum Hive uh, format is you actually have the opportunity to talk to Emily directly. So we're, we're going to try to spend as much of the time as we can in the question and answer part of the session. So um, it's pretty straightforward. Uh, hold your questions until we're the end of Emily's remarks, and we'll try to answer as many questions as we can. You can also ask them. Yes. Yes. If you don't, if you need further encouragement to you. Spread this on social media, please do. Hashtags are up on the wall. Talk about it on Twitter and Instagram and Facebook. Um, and that's really all I have to so say. You don't want to listen to me talk. Emily, are you ready to go? Yes, I'm excited. Take it away. Perfect. Yeah, and if somebody's monitoring questions online, that would be great too. I tweeted this link out, so I think we should ask from other places. Um, but uh, anyway, my name is Emily Grassley. I am the Field Museum's Chief Curiosity Correspondent. Um, my primary role at the Field Museum in Chicago is that I'm the creator, host, writer, and producer of our educational YouTube series, The Brain Scoop. The Brain Scoop, independently, as a volunteer, um, my first volunteer position when I was just a curatorial assistant at the University of Montana Zoological Museum. Um, and the Brain Scoop is kind of a culmination of, uh, or it was kind of an outgrowth of a blog that I had started talking about natural history museums and, and the roles that they serve in our lives. Um, and from that, I was fortunate enough to be kind of in the right place at the right time to meet Hank Green, who is a YouTube educator and entrepreneur, and he saw a lot of potential in my role at the as a volunteer in that museum and essentially helped me start the brain scoop in January of 2013 um, and a couple months after that I had the opportunity to visit the field museum here in Chicago they were familiar with my program and the stars all sort of aligned and there was an opportunity to bring me on board as a, a, a new staff position something they've never had before and that's essentially how, that's a short version of how I became the Field Museum's Chief Curiosity Correspondent. Um, so they helped, they picked the title, which I thought was just absolutely perfect. 
Um, but in the four and a half years that I've been creating educational content for, for YouTube, I've also been trying to advocate really strongly for other museums to create positions like mine. So my job doesn't really have a formal description to it. It's not, um, it, it didn't have a, a well laid out blueprint. It was kind of like, we've never done anything like this before, so let's incorporate somebody who kind of has um, an independent voice in an independent project and they can be free to move outside of what we traditionally would accept as museum communications and gave us really an opportunity to innovate and to expand uh, the people who we're reaching and the type of content that we're talking about on our program. And so it's always my goal that with events like this, I can try to encourage other museum professionals in our community to hire other chief curiosity correspondents. So I'm currently the one and only in the world, and there is no great conference for me to go to. I want to go to the conference of chief curiosity correspondents. That is the conference I'd like to attend every year. And so um, I spend a lot of time traveling to other museums and talking to administrators and executives about that we can incorporate science communicators within our museums. But really, the, the sort of job that I do could be applied to any kind of museum that has a collection. Some, I have a, an art history background and, an, and a studio art background, and sometimes I just fantasize about what it would be like if I had my position at the Art Institute in Chicago or at the Met Museum. I mean, just the level of expertise and the available resources working in these organizations is the most untapped gold mine for content creators and for communication specialists. Um, and I think we, we are stronger together when we can share some of these resources and help train the next generation of communicators uh, in empowering them to talk about museums in this new sort of way. So, I have a lot of random things that I could talk about, but I really just want to focus my time on answering any questions that you all might have. And if you'd like for me to go into more details about the sort of programs that we create or how we pick our content or who our audience is, I'm happy to answer any of those questions. But mostly I just want to am helping you from my recliner. All right. Um, questions? Anyone? So Go for it. Um, yeah. Um, so you talked a little bit about like how you started uh, first as a curatorial assistant. Can you talk a little bit more about um, I guess how you can you just go a little bit more into how you became the chief curiosity? Yeah. So I was an art major at the University of Montana. I um, I primarily let's do this fun thing. I primarily studied studio art and I'm now apparently you can see my screen um, so what I did as an undergraduate was really focus on landscape painting and this is my senior thesis painting um, it's 13 feet long and, and 8 feet tall so this was the kind of thing I was interested in doing as an art major just a lot of like very large scale landscape paintings and then I came across the Zoological Museum at the University of Montana and didn't, one, know that it existed, and two, didn't know that as an art major this could be a resource for me. And so I started to go to the museum and create still lifes about some of the specimens there and gradually became more and more interested in why they were there and less interested in creating artwork about them. And so I did this series which was all about specimens in the museum that had visible pathologies. And I will be the first to admit that I'm not the most talented artist <laughs> that has ever lived. Um, but I really enjoyed creating these artworks and, and associating like of each specimen with uh, you know, the unique number that it had and then the information that came in on the label. And through that, I just began spending a lot more time with the specimens and focusing on the curatorial techniques to house them. Um, and I kind of transitioned from doing sketches to paintings and then photography of the specimens. Um, I really enjoyed doing things like this where you can take different species and compare them in a visual sort of way. So you were doing comparative analysis, just surface level morphological stuff. Um, became really interested in, in anatomy and just looking at the, and so this is 
is where I used to sit at the desk and I had all my little still lifes up on this really disorganized shelf. Um, but we didn't have a whole lot of space in this collection. So you can kind of see down here where there is, you know, here was our catalog book that we were still doing everything by hand in the catalog that was associated with the card catalog, believe it or not. Um, and then just like trays of specimens stacked up together. So this is where I was supposed to be creating the artwork and there was no room for it. And so in order to create the space, I had to figure out where those specimens were supposed to go. But first I had to catalog them and then I had to figure out how I was gonna curate them within the collection. So by the time I ended my internship, I had spent more time actually with the, um, focusing on the, the curation aspect of it than I did the art aspect of it. But I started posting these photos to a blog that I started, which was at first uh, umzoology.tumblr.com. And it's eventually what came the Brain Scoop Tumblr. But I posted these photos as a way for people to have an entry point into collections. Because even if you didn't know anything about these things scientifically, you could show them a picture of these you know, 10 bat skulls and uh, help people understand the, the differences of bats that even live in Montana. Um, and to try and increase people's understanding and appreciation for the biodiversity in, in their region. And that was really great working in Montana because this was a local collection. Um, and so I s continued to volunteer in this collection from uh, after I graduated in 2011 until I left for my job at the Field Museum in 2013. So I had a good three and a half years of volunteer work in this museum. And I think that really gave me a, a, not only a good hand in visual storytelling, which translated really well into creating um, uh, video storytelling, uh, but it also gave me an increased appreciation for the kind of work that happens in a museum and the challenges and the financial struggles and the personnel struggles. And what volunteering in this museum did, I think, the best was to help me create something out of very little resources. Um, it really emphasized being resourceful. So that's kind of how I got my background in, in museum work. Um, and then, you know, through the creation of the Brain Scoop, which is, I already have it open. Um, you know, I've been making videos for the Brain Scoop for, uh, four and a half years and we have about 170 at this point and they all start so they start off in that collection with just like basic tours of what we were doing in the collection this was our first official uh brain scoop video just a tour of the philip l wright zoological museum and then just I, it kind of took off from there all right um emily can i ask a follow-up question yeah uh, when you were first thinking about the brain scoop, how did you, or did you at all, um, talk with your bosses at the museum about getting permission to communicate about the museum? Well, <laughs> I get asked that question a lot by, by people who are thinking about uh, yeah, absolutely. professionals who are like, I think I might want to blog, but I'm not sure if I should, or who would want to listen to me, or I don't know how to talk to my boss about getting permission. So I'd love to hear more about journey that's a very fair question and uh, I'll be the first also to admit that I was in a great position at that museum because uh, our curator had been there for 20 years and was part-time status that entire time so we were a really underfunded under resourced museum and I really cared about that collection like I like I was maniacal about how much I cared about that collection I essentially like I don't know, I, I just lost focus of everything else in my life for a while and just catered everything I was doing to volunteering in that museum because I felt as though like my life and the future of that collection depended on it. Um, one of the things that happened, um, and I hope, wonder if I can find it if I screen share again, but um, we'll, go to, we'll go to the blog and I'll illustrate something that I saw spoke to me in a way that was like, you know, the TSA, if you see something, say something. <laughs> um, because when I was volunteering there, and it might take me a second to find this, but, um, oh boy, these are things I used to blog about. Um, this is something that happened when I was a volunteer there. So here's the Missoula Fire Department. 
And here's our wet collection. We had 4,000 specimens that were being stored in um, boxes. And they had been moved out of a uh, completely secure location in order to make space for, I think, a visiting uh, uh, professor. And so they gave our curator something like 48 or 72 hours to move these 4,000 specimens, many of which were the first biological collections in Montana, especially from Flathead Lake, um, into what was essentially a, a utility room. You can see some utility boxes back here. This is an electrical box. And they were supposed to be there only for a year. And when I started volunteering at the museum, they'd been there for seven or eight years. And one day in the middle of the night, one of the um, uh, uh, pieces of electrical equipment, I think it was a, a water heater or something, malfunctioned. And it ended up spewing a bunch of steam all over the walls. And then it kind of fell down onto these boxes. And they all collapsed in on one another. I thought this was completely outrageous. I mean, you can also see this was a completely insecure location. People would go down there, rummage through the boxes, steal specimens, graffiti the walls. Um, they weren't secured at all. They were duct tape across the top. And so I took these photos at 1130 at night on a Monday because Dave had called me clean up this mess because there wasn't anything. And so here we are, you know, trying to pick gum wrappers out from around the specimens and trying to keep the specimens with the jars in the, in the location. Um, and so this was the kind of thing that I posted on the blog. And, and I had started the blog mo mostly as a way to communicate about the artwork that I was creating. And I wanted to put it online. And, you know, Dave was, com the curator was completely in support of what I wanted to do. And so he was really a great facilitator for that. And then when it came to this kind of content, I just couldn't see not sharing it. Um, because I saw that, the, you know, the administration of the, of the uh, university wasn't going to do anything. And they hadn't done anything. And there hadn't been any kind of pressure put on them to do something. What did I have to lose? I had already given them all of my undergraduate tuition money. I had my degree at that point. So, you know, they hadn't given me a job despite, you know, you invest so much of yourself. And so, I don't know, maybe it was not the right thing to do. Um, but I say something about it because as someone who didn't have a scientific background, but as somebody who was like deeply invested in taking care and, and being a steward of the history of the state that I loved, you know, it really broke my heart to go through and labels from specimens that were 120 years old. I, there just didn't seem to be a reason for it. So uh, that's kind of what started me down this path of museum advocacy. And um, at that point, I think it really, the success, or at least it not getting it shut down in the beginning, is because it kind of flew under the radar. Um, and I wasn't an employee. I was a former student. I was just a volunteer. Maybe that had something to do with it. But I know that when we started the Brain Scoop, um, again, I was doing this all with permission from the curator of the collection. And the, I had some conversations with administration, but they didn't really seem to know what they wanted to do from it with it. And the marketing team at the university saw, you know, marketing potential, but we had some conversations and they wanted me to make videos about the school cafeteria and I was not interested. <laughs> and I wanted to make videos about science and collections. And um, I imagine things probably would have been shut down pretty quickly after that had I not been offered the job at the Field Museum. But I think that's really, you know, the Field Museum was more or less aware that I was doing these things and having these conversations online, engaging people with them. And I think the positivity really outweighed whatever negative, you know, feedback could have come from it because even before I started at the Field Museum, it had something like 50,000 followers. Same thing with my, with my YouTube channel. In the first four months, I think our YouTube channel had 150,000 subscribers. It had been written about by, you know, NPR, Scientific American, uh, a couple of other news outlets. And the feedback was overwhelmingly positive. When I came to visit the Field Museum, just, you know, I was going there to film some videos. I didn't know they were going to offer me a job, but um, I showed up and we did a public meetup and like a hundred people showed up to this public meetup just to come tour the collection with me. And then at the field, Richard LaRiviere was there to see that. 
and to see like the positive interactions that people were having in the collections and in the exhibits. And I think that really spoke more to whatever other potential side effects could be. I don't know. Um, but that's really kind of why I've been an advocate for transparency, because you can't hope to endear the public to what you're trying to do if they think that you're not telling them the full story. Okay, okay. Anyone else? Questions? Yes. Dan. I do. Come on up and Emily, I've got a question for you. You're an outstanding presenter. How did you uh, come to be a great public speaker and, you know, speak extemporaneously and all that stuff? Were you always a dramatist? <laughs> yes. Did, it, uh, did, you, did you grow into it? So I'm really lucky that when I was a kid, I did a lot of children's theater. And then my first job was being um, working as an understudy and running the light board at a children's theater park. Um, I did drama in high school and I've just, I think I always just had a little more natural confidence in front of crowds, but I've attributed that to my like exceedingly low self-esteem. Like I don't, I don't have an ego. And so if I go in front of a crowd, mostly I'm just like, I don't know why these people want me here. I don't know what a value I can say, but I've got nothing to lose. And so I think that... <laughs> That um, that realness of my personality just really helps me be seen as a relatable person. And like then it's just kind of a weird, surreal experience. Like here I am sitting in my house in my recliner, like looking at my cats over there and just talking to a group of professionals assembled. It could like this could be a movie. I don't know. I, there's some part of me that is like separated from reality in a really great way. But then sometimes it all comes in at once and you're like, this is my life, wah! Mm -hmm. um, but anyway, I, again, like I think just a lot of theater, a lot of like um, public speaking experiences when I was younger. Um, and also going through art school, oh my gosh. Like what other major do you, are you expected to put all of your whole personal self into something and then put it up for public review from people who don't, more or less care anything about you <laughs> like, like yes but but I think going like dealing with a lot of art critiques in undergraduate were like they were some of the most constructive and like character building experiences it's probably why I'm also good at dealing with YouTube comments because it's like, oh, please, that was nothing like that YouTube comment was nothing compared to the 45 minute tirade my co, I don't know, landscape painter gave in a, at the end of a figure painting session. I don't know. So. All right. Um, I, I want to ask a follow-up on that one because one of the things that I'm, I'm particularly interested in is um, how do you deal with being a visible public figure on the internet and all of the crap that that entails, uh, particularly commenters? What, what, what do you do to prepare yourself? Do you see that? <laughs> <laughs> okay, cats. Okay. No, for real, they're one, those cats are amazing. Um, but, you know, it's, I'd, I'd be lying if I said it was, like, easy. It's not easy. But I think um, what's harder than dealing with anonymous feedback online is dealing with institutional pressure that's mostly imposed on myself by me. Um, you know, dealing with people who don't know me on the internet, like that's something that stings really hard in the beginning, especially um, when you want to be, you want to have a reputation as being a qualified educator. And then some troll is going to dig up something and try to say something like, this girl has no idea what she's doing. She's got an art degree and she's a phony. And it's like, well, that kind of sucks if he was right. But I was hired by the president of one of the greatest natural history museums in the country. So, sucker, like, no, you have no power over me. <laughs> um, so, more than that, it's, it's really important to surround yourself with people who are completely supportive of what it is that you're doing. Um, my friends and family and my partner are, are so supportive of what I do to the point where 
I, I would much rather listen to any and all of their feedback than somebody who has no personal investment in who I am as a human being, regardless if I'm famous on the internet or not. So um, I think really surrounding yourself by people who can bring you back to reality in that way is really important. But again, I think the thing that is harder than just anonymous comments on the internet is knowing that every time I tweet or every time I do something like this or every time that I make any kind of public statement, um, it's carrying that, that burden of responsibility that I have to my institution and to the museum field in general. And that is like the overwhelmingly crushing, like, oh, my, like my fear that I'm just going to say or do something that's going to, to somehow uh, harm the trust that this institution and that this community has put in me. That is far scarier than anonymous snowblow Joe saying that <laughs> You know, I look fatter in this episode than the last episode. <laughs> hey, dude. Horizontal stripes do that to a person. Just saying. Do you have a question from online? Yeah. Um, oh. No, from Sierra. <laughs> so, given that like the brain scoop is pretty much your baby, how do you? Is there ever like a struggle with the content or the direction of the blog slash YouTube? Can you say that again? Given that the brain scoop is essentially your baby, is there ever a struggle with the content or direction? Uh, how do you handle that? That's a good question. Um, well, you know, I didn't start doing the brain scoop and I didn't start blogging because I wanted to be a famous or well known person. It really wasn't. It's because I passionately and sometimes irrationally care about museums. I, I always, my goal was to create some kind of platform that could help other people see and appreciate these institutions in a similar way that I do. So starting the blog, the initially was feeding into that. And then when it kind of transformed into the brain scoop, it wasn't, what are the videos I can do to make myself famous? It was like, what are the videos that are gonna have the most impact and are going to be the most important for our community. Um, and so that has really helped us cater the kind of content that we that we try to serve. I would say that for the next couple of years even, um, the content is taken out of my hands. I have relinquished that and given that to broader impacts for National Science Foundation grants. I don't like, I, if anybody who I work with at my institution wants uh, to incorporate the brain scoop into broader impacts for NSF, that is absolutely the kind of mission-based content I want to be creating. It might be sometimes esoteric science. It might be incredibly convoluted. It might be really difficult for me to understand. But my God, if that if our inclusion in a grant can help bring in more support for the science that we're trying to do, and if I can you know, use the brain scoop as a vehicle to talk about the sort of um, innovative research that's happening at my institution, then it's more of a fun challenge than anything. So um, I'm incorporated in a grant that might take us to Western China to do field work in a, a, a place that has been called um, the belly of the fire or something like that. And it's like, well, that doesn't sound like a vacation, but I'm down. <laughs> <laughs> that sounds like it's gonna be kind of hot but like these are the realities of field work uh, these are the realities of the kind of work that happens at the field museum so to that extent I am more than happy to, to use the platform that I have to, to help serve uh, other people um, and then sometimes it's like what does the audience need as well what is what are what kind of content are we creating that uh, could help better fill in knowledge gaps of our audience. And it's really great that we've been making content for so long because our audience has started to kind of age up with us, where when I think we started, it was uh, a younger demographic. I think it was closer to like 14 or maybe 15 to 19 year olds who were really watching our content, people who kind of maybe had a surface level interest in biology. And now a lot of those people are writing me and saying like, I'm graduating college or, somebody who started watching our program when they were in eighth grade who is now just starting college with a much clearer idea and direction for what it is that they want to do. So keeping that in mind really helps us direct our content as well. And one thing that we see that's really important is that um, people want to see scientists. They want to see what kind of work scientists do. 
Um, they want to know what the possibilities are for museum work. So not just what the si people are doing on the science side of things, but what, what our other options are working in these organizations. And then how they can get involved, how they can get involved in science in their own communities, in their own schools, in their programs. Um, and so we, we try to focus content on that. So for instance, we did a video a year ago called Was it, What is a Species? where we, it was just about biological species concept and how do scientists know what a species is anyway. And we made that video because we realized that in four years of making this show, we've never bothered to define what a species was. So we're using vocabulary that we've never taken the time to explain. Um, and that video ended up being pretty complicated because would, if you had know it, the scientists like actually don't have one universally agreed upon definition for a species concept. There's something like 26, which is not so. And so I was, I was like, this is much more complicated topic than I thought. Um, so we did that video and then the, we did the follow up, which was the taxonomy of candy, which is I had four of our curators who all work on different organisms. We had a mammologist, a, a, somebody who studies bugs, somebody who studies octopuses and somebody who studies fossils. And I gave them 13 different kinds of candy and asked them how they would taxonomically arrange them. So are they all going to put all of the red things together? Because if so, that means you're saying that the red M&Ms and the red peanut M&Ms and the red cinnamon jelly bellies are all the same species. And then there was another scientist saying, like, that's absurd. You could never do that. You have to dissect their contents. And then she pulled out a pocket knife and started cutting candy open to do dissections. It was amazing. Um, but anyway, those, that's just an example of two videos we created kind of in a pair. One can, that can be the technical explanation of something, and, and then another that can be more of a hands-on, even a project you could do in your classroom, um, but just a more tangible way of thinking about these kind of big abstract ideas. Cool. All right, questions? Katie. I have a question. Um, so I have to admit, I am part of your audience, um, but I'm going to ask. Okay. I think I've been following you before you went to the Field Museum. Um, I'm a huge fan, um, and it's it's cool because I also am a museum. Um, but my question for you is: uh, Do you know who your audience is? How many of them are from Chicago or from like? How many of them are also the audience of the Field Museum? And that does that matter? to your bosses? Does it matter well, that's a really good question. Um, let me see if I can pull this up here. I will show you. And I'm also, well, Data. Data. <laughs> let me, okay. I'm going to try to go to the page first and then pull up that information. I think I can share that widely, like with the whole of the internet, right? Yeah. That's it's a good all right, this. So I can show you. Um, let's do the screen share. There we go. Okay. So here's our audience. Um, this is our all our audience for. Actually, let's do lifetime. These are our lifetime demographics. This information is probably really important. I don't know. Anyway, so this is looking at 19 million views. Um, 83 million minutes of videos watched. And you can see a pretty clear breakdown between at least two of the largest age demographics. We have 36% between 25 and 34 years and 38% between 18 and 24. And so that's kind of what I meant when our audience is aging up with us. Um, this slice used to be a lot smaller. But what I think is even more interesting is our gender breakdown because we have one of the the strongest gender breakdowns of any science channel on the internet. 40% um, of our audience is female, 60% is male. And so when I talk to other YouTube science creators, it's more like 85 to 95% male to 10 to 15% female audience. Mm -hmm. So that's, this is really important to me, this, this breakdown. Um, it tells me that we're doing something that resonates with with a, a female demographic, and that's, you know, when you're talking about inclusion of more women and more um, minorities in STEM fields, the gender breakdown, I think, is really important to me. Um, when you look at other, that's just genders, but if we look at, what are we gonna look at? We're gonna look back, where am I going? I want geography, that's what I want. So, um, 
45% of our audience lives outside of the United States. So that's been really important for us to understand. Um, this is watch time, so that says 57%. But if this was just views alone, it would be 45%. Um, but that's really important for us to understand because most of our audience isn't in the Chicago region, which makes, like, totally frees up us up through the brain scoop to create content that is more internationally focused. Um, and it also kind of took the pressure off of me to want to uh, do things like videos that would promote upcoming exhibits, right? We already have a marketing team that's investing a lot of resources and time and energy into marketing around this region for upcoming exhibits to get people on site. But what about everything else that's happening? Um, and so that's the brain scoop has really been an asset to the field museum in that way. So uh, we can think a little bit further outside the box. And actually, when we do videos that are about Chicago, they are viewed far less <laughs> than than other ones that we've done. Um, so that to me is really interesting. And this is all pretty typical based off of population of people. I guess Illinois is third. But so that's kind of like a the who and the what. But if anybody has a PhD or once is working on a PhD and they want to do like, I seriously, I've been trying to partner with um, somebody who wants to take all of our information and actually synthesize it in a meaningful way and like write a dissertation about it. If you're that person, please contact me. I have so much data. <laughs> yeah, questions? Yeah, I guess um, I was really intrigued when you were talking about um, the youth. Uh, and your demographic aging up. So, can you do you have any advice on like capturing the use in online content at all? I know that's really important in this across disciplines. Sorry, can you say that one more time? Um, I know that capturing the youth is really important across disciplines, uh, just when it comes to content creation. So, I'm wondering if you have any advice on uh, that. Yeah, that's a great question. On reaching the kids? Hello, yeah. fiddle kids. Well, this is something that I kind of become increasingly terrified about as like I just had my 28th birthday and I like turn on the radio and I'm like, what is this music? Um, but then again, I've always, I've never been like really culturally in tune with things. I think what's more important is that um, you use inclusive language. Uh, you have an authentic, a relatable voice and personality. Um, and even things like, I don't know, it gets a little gimmicky sometimes, but I still love it. But like, I theme my clothes in our videos based off of the topic that we're talking about. So if we're doing a video about rocks, I wear a geology shirt. So I just like, to me, that's personally amusing, but I also think it kind of plays into this idea of maybe what I'm doing is being a little bit of a character, you know, trying to channel my inner Miss Frizzle because that's who I related to when I was a young person. So, you know what, I, I think really it's uh, more than like to trying to figure out what topics kids are into or what the youth will be interested in is making stuff that shows that you can have fun at your job and that your work is collaborative and that adults can be fun and funny and goofy. Um, I think that's something that children, especially in a school setting, maybe think of themselves more of like a very different other, you know, like you become an adult and then you lose all these other aspects of your personality. And so perpetuating that idea of lifelong curiosity and enthusiasm and wonderment, no matter what age you are, you know, never let your imagination die. That's kind of something that's been important to us too. All right, Mike, you did it. All right. Was that a question? Somebody in the next room is yelling really loud. Oh. Speak up, Marty. I say that I actually remember quite distinctly being a kid and being addressed as you. And hey, because it was so condescending and so fake. And you know, the idea that people were trying to cut down concepts that fit in my tiny little mind was actually offensive. So I think you're doing quite the right thing by addressing kids as if they are people who are curious, uh, among other people who are curious, instead of, who are the youth? Let me address you. And you're being Well done. All right. Alan and do you have a question? Um, so my question is, why? Hi. <laughs> um, 
in terms of like figuring out who your colleagues are, right? Creating this kind of thing in other institutions. What are some of the key features that you think are important to replicate? So for example, I'm thinking about how this might work in my institution and how I might contribute to that. I hope you see my gray hair. Um, that like I can imagine a couple things that I might be really excited about talk about, but maybe that's not enough for a whole series. And so how much do you think it's really key that it's you as a person or that there's a person who is identified with this kind of thing versus a series of people who come in and provide um, interesting tidbits about what's going on? How much of it is sort of personality-based and how much is a lot of people who are interested in sharing really cool stuff that they're passionate about um, to a wider audience? That's, that's an interesting question. And I think it probably just comes down to um, what your vehicle for communication is. So we use the brain scoop as our vehicle to talk about field museum science because the audience has kind of come with me. Um, but again, like I try to not be the primary focus of the program, despite being the host and the re creator. Um, I want to I want to use my personality as a conduit for somebody else. Um, but at the same time, like take a show like Mysteries at the Museum. You know, this is a what? How many series have they had so far? Like they're on season fifteen or something. They continue to find ideas and objects and peoples in, in museums all over the country who can contribute to these these smaller snippets and smaller stories. They've really found a great way of stories and doing it in a way that people just tune into consistently. And they have a huge uh, viewership. You guys know what I'm talking about? The Travel Channel show? I've been on it a couple times. It was awesome. Um, but, you know, it just depends on, like, what the resources are available to you. Uh, I do think that there's a real hunger and appetite for things that spark people's individual curiosity. And more than that, People like to relate to enthusiastic people. You know, I'd like, I used to joke that I could have a whole show about how you manufacture styrofoam peanuts, and if I was that jacked about it, then I could probably get at least a couple people to watch. Um, but it doesn't really matter what the, what the object is. I think for me, getting people to relate to museums is getting people to relate to museum people, if that makes sense. Um, and just being clear and acknowledging some of the quirks and interesting parts of our job and that's really what makes us coming back a lot of the times but it's hard to t it's hard to give you a specific example without knowing like what your internal or external resources are for communications you guys want to talk about that. Yeah. <laughs> all right anyone anyone in the back of the room anyone, anyone? I'm just curious about what your job is like at the field museum. Like, what do you do when you go into work? Yeah, what's a day like at the field museum for Emily Grass? Oh my gosh. Well, I would show you just a screen grab of my inbox, but that's probably revealing too much personal <laughs> information. Um, it really depends on the day. So, uh, at any one time, I'm developing between two and four new video ideas. Uh, which just takes a lot of work. So we film a couple times a month and we publish a video every other week. So I need to always be thinking about what our next project is going to be. That can be, that can be pretty challenging because on the one hand, it's like we want to create consistent, timely content. But if you really want to think big picture to what a dream project that might be more involved or more detailed would be like, um, sometimes that gets a little lost in the shuffle when you're just trying to hit your day-to-day -day deadlines. But um, what did I do today? So I was asked by a, um, a broad, somebody's really upset. I was asked by um, a media organization to pitch them an idea for an hour-long documentary. So that's something that I spent some time working on today. You know, something that is much more long-term, something that probably wouldn't come to fruition until 2019. So I'm thinking like it, oftentimes two to five year projects. And especially now that we're doing more NSF broader impact stuff, I mean, you know, a good portion of my day is sometimes is, is budgeting or coming up with budgets and strategic plans for those things. You know, the same kind of stuff that every museum person has to do one point or another. 
Um, but I'm also occasionally making original content for social media, although far less now than I used to because I just don't have time. But today I got to do a really fun thing where we have a new interactive exhibition on our on our public floor on the uh, right off Stanley Field Hall where you enter the museum called the Science Hub. And they have lab tables in there and they have spaces for displays and collections. And uh, they also have cameras. So they have one overhead camera and one camera behind one of the tables. But the goal of the Granger Hub is for it to be like this interactive space where visitors can come in and see science kind of in action. And so we've been doing a summer program where once a month I prepare a specimen for just live in, in the hub. And that's been a lot of fun. So I get to work with our collection staff to identify a specimen from, that needs to be prepared. And then we advertise that on social media. But any visitor to the museum can come in and talk to me about specimen preparation. And then I can also tell them about the brain scoop, um, which just reminded me that I really need to make flyers to hand out at that. Because I've just been telling people, just Google me. Just, they'll feel fine. Just do like, like Emily Field Museum and it'll come up. And then I'm like, that's not, that's not how I should be marketing these. But anyways, um, so like I'm also really glad uh, that I'm doing this abroad because my hands still smell like muskrat. Um, but, so it's, sometimes it's, sometimes I spend my day thinking about on-site programming. Sometimes I'm thinking about inter-institutional collaborations. Um, the last couple months we spent working with uh, or coming together with a plan to work with the Denver Museum of Nature and Science. We published our first video from that collaboration last week and we have two more from that partnership too. So this is a way that we've been able to expand our program to do more things like individual programs for museums because I realize that most museums don't have the staff or capacity or talent or personnel to do something like invest into a big multi-episode series. So we're trying to, again, use the Brain Scoop as a vehicle for doing so. And that helps our program. It helps my program grow a little bit. We and then we can also here. partner with these other. Yeah. Oh, no. Yeah. <sighs> All right. Can you, can you hear me now? Can you hear us, Emily? I can hear you. Oh, that's a big head. All right. We can't hear you. Oh, no. What about now? Now we can hear you. Let me turn you down a little bit. Uh, okay. Okay. Say hello again, Emily. Hello. Okay, perfect. Where did I right. cut out? Uh, about, oh, content. Think about yeah, so it was right after talking about um, collaborations with places that didn't have the time or, or resources in order to do a multi part series themselves. Yeah, so that's been uh, something that. I started in March working with the Denver Museum, and then we filmed three videos with them back in June, and are just starting to push those videos out now. And so it's kind of figuring out like, what's the next museum that we're going to partner with, and what's that content going to look like? And um, so there, there's a lot of stuff. I also do a lot of classroom talks and speaking engagements and um, campus lectures and talking to school groups. I do a lot of stuff. <laughs> All right. All right, then we have time for maybe one or two more questions. Gene, speak up. You talked a lot about stories and telling stories. You talked so much about that in the museum. Now I wonder if you could tell us a little bit more about your perspective when you know you have a good story or what the elements are that come together to, to create a story. What makes, I'm sorry, a I get really, what makes a good story and how do I know? Um, yeah. I know because I get. I get really sweaty. <laughs> like if I'm listening to somebody talk and they just like, usually they're doing it in a totally nonchalant manner. That's another thing I love about museum people is you'll run into someone in the hall and you're like, hey, Steve, what's new? And he's like, oh, not much. I just have a 1,300 page manuscript out and uh, I described uh, five new species from Madagascar this month. and. Oh, I may have found a cure for a communicable disease also, but... And you're just like, what is happening? Um, so, 
Like I, I have a physical visceral reaction when I'm listening to somebody. And it's something that I've like really tried to hone over time so that I can even in like less exciting circumstances, I can still pick up on like what one of those cues might be. So basically anything that somebody's talking and I get a spark and something else comes to mind as a way to like tie in those two themes. Um, I also watch a lot of stand up comedy. So uh, I try to channel my inner like Mike Birbiglia whenever I'm giving a public lecture. Uh, I love the self-referential treatment that he has to his monologues. I love that he's like so self-deprecating, but also complete, completely relatable. Um, so I watch a lot of stand-up comedy and try to like take cues from comedians that I admire. Um, I just a lot of like problem. I don't know. Maybe they're non-conventional, um, but you know anything that I don't know. It's it's like it's got to be something that speaks to you. But at the same time, I love the challenge of uh, listening to somebody talk about their work and then trying to find out what that interesting nugget is. So, you know, I was talking to somebody about um, their work and they study unionid bivalves. And this is a story that I tell pretty frequently, but it's one that I love. And they said, just like, you know, uh, of all of the endangered species in the United States, like 86 of those are species of freshwater clams that live in rivers in the Midwest. And you're like, wow, that's a lot of, I didn't even know there were probably 86 species of clams anywhere, but apparently the 86 around here are endangered. And then I asked this person, well, what is contributing to the species decline and population decline of these freshwater bivalves? And she looked me in the eye and she said, the button industry. <laughs> I was like, the button industry? The malicious, evil, big button industry? And it's true. It's like, when you think about uh, pearly muscles or um, pearl buttons, they are punched out of the shell of these freshwater bivalves. And it was it were these uh, button manufacturers that moved into the Midwest in the uh, late part of the 1800s, early 1900s, that completely overfished and overfarmed these bivalves and punched them all full of buttons, and then just like threw them back in the river. And so, uh, to me, that's always that's one thing that made this seemingly uncharismatic, seemingly you know boring organism or animal something that's actually truly fascinating and that has a fascinating origin um, to the reason that it's endangered. So. You know, anytime you can go after Big Button, that's a <laughs> win for the wildlife. All right. Sierra? All right. Uh, what do you think is like the next online frontier that people slash museum slash institution should be paying attention to? The next trend? Yeah. Or online frontier were the words she yeah. used. <laughs> Online frontier, that's a good question. I think it's gonna be really interesting to see how museums navigate the social media landscape in the next couple of years, especially concerning our current political climate. I think museums are really at a precipice for change in how we talk with the public and engage with the public about serious issues. Um, and I think it's gonna, it's gonna be really challenging, but it's not so much that we're, we may be inventing new platforms or new ways to engage people. I have less of a sense of that. I, I have more of an interest in seeing how we're going to respond to challenging circumstances in a way that's public facing. So this is something that the Field Museum has committed to boldly doing. You know, we don't want to be seen as an old, dusty, stodgy institution. We want to be seen as an organization of change and progress and bold action. And so uh, I think that's really exciting, at least from our institution standpoint, uh, because we want to we want to be more open with our visitors. We want to be more relevant. We want to feel more relevant to um, a more diverse group of people. And sometimes that means relinquishing the voice of authority. Sometimes and not necessarily saying that we're no longer an authority, but wanting to empower more people into feeling like they're uh, authoritative enough to talk about these situations. Or, you know, I'm trying to not be too vague, but I love what the Welcome Museum did a couple of months ago. They got a black activist named uh, Busty Beats to do a co-curated exhibit, and then she did a social media takeover for a week and talked about, you know, this pretty 
traditional collection and how it was started um, from very Western uh, uh, origins, colonial origins, and then how the Welcome Museum is kind of addressing their past and wanting to look forward to the future. Um, it was just the, the coolest thing I've seen a museum do by relinquishing the voice of control and giving it to somebody who had something to say and something definitely worth saying on a platform like that. So I'm super excited to see how other museums will do that. And I know it's going to be super challenging and everybody's really afraid, but it's going to be great. Excellent. All right. You can be quiet up in the back there. Uh, okay. I have one more question. I know we're getting right up against time. I want to hear a little bit, Emily, about what the March for Science in Chicago was like and what was it like talking to, what was it, 60,000 people? Oh, my God. That was the coolest thing I've ever done in my whole life. It was terrifying. It was so scary. I it was terrifying. Um, but it was also really awesome. It was so awesome for our museum. So, you know, I I was gonna be a supporter for the March for Science regardless if the Field Museum got on board in a professional capacity. But I'm really privileged that I was in a position that I felt like I could help encourage that from within. Um, we had so many people from all around the building who you know, just came together and came to our administration and came to our, our department heads and said, can we please do something? We want to participate. And we think that this could be really good for our museum. Um, and so there was an organizer who was, uh, who worked in our exhibitions department and she got us and had uh, in touch with the people who were going to be organizing the whole thing. And so for months ahead of time, we tried to figure out ways that we could support what they were doing. And in the end, what accumulated was, something great. I mean, we had, I think, 300 Field Museum staff and their family members all participating, all wearing, you know, matching shirts and carrying matching signs and handing out buttons. Um, we were able to pull together an outdoor science expo with dozens of vendors and representatives of scientific organizations and programs all around the Chicago region who could have like little science fair booths where they interacted with the public to talk about what they were doing and to get more volunteers and to you know, advertise their services and their programs. And then I was asked to be the keynote speaker. So in all of this, you know, we had three um, great speakers representing different sectors and uh, groups around Chicago. And then I got the chance to give the 12 minute speech to more people than lived in the town I grew up in. So <laughs> um, it was the most rewarding experience of my life so far. It was just the optimism and enthusiasm of that crowd was amazing. And then we all got to march to the Field Museum. It was cool. All right. I'm conscious of your time. Um, so I think we should probably wrap it up, Brad. Um, can we have a, a big round of applause? Thank you for having me. This is fun. Yay. Okay, enjoy the rest of your evening. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Bye.